how these two North American players are going to face down against each other in their winning in game. Remember, there is everything to play for. They are playing for a place in the finals. Jonathan leading out here with two fire type Pokemon. We've got the Cinderace and the Incineroar, whereas Joseph has gone for the Dragapult and the Amoongus. Well, this is probably one of the worst things that the Amoongus has to face down is two fire types, as you <laughs> mentioned. Um, but I like that it's paired with the Dragapult. I like that uh, Joseph is looking at this saying, all right, well, maybe I can I can get some good value uh, out of this Dragapult. Uh, that said, I mean, if you ignore the Amoongus entirely, uh, then, it, then it's able to just cause problems, right? And that's something that uh, I think... Joseph's going to have to play into mm. and try and kind of sneak out a little advantage. Of course, Incineroar does have limited options, I guess, in, in what it can do against it, um, you know, apart, outside of Flare Blitz. But if this Cinderace starts to go off and start dealing huge damage, that could be a huge issue as well. So both trainers with a number of decisions to make in this first turn, I think. Yeah, there's a lot of Dynamax potential to be here in turn one. You know, Dragapult really well known for boosting itself up and going for something like Max Airstreams or even the Max Wormwind start lowering the attack of the opposing Pokemon. But again, Cinderace on the other side of the field, another really well-known Dynamax Pokemon. Again, it wants to go for those Max Airstreams in order to boost the speed on Jonathan's side of the field. And a Max Airstream would be a very good move to target down into that Amoongus if potentially followed up with a Fire-type move or even just a Fake Out from that Incineroar in order to start removing that threat from the field. It is going to be Jonathan going for that Dynamax button first, and it will be the Gigantamax Cinderace here on the field. Joseph, however, opting to go for the Dragon Dance instead. Really love this play. It's bold. Boosts up the speed of the Dragapult. I mean, Amoongus doesn't really need the speed boost. It's not always the most useful, but crucially gets the attack. And if Dragapult is able to go into this next turn safely, then it's going to be in prime position to go for the Dynamax. The Cobra Berry being revealed on that Amoongus, again, is critical. Going to be able to survive this Max Airstream, which it would not have been able to do without access to the item. But I'm interested to see what Jonathan's going to do with the Incineroar. The Incineroar play is going to be key here. The Cobra Berry, though, very important. Taking that max airstream. Well, uh, Incineroar heading right after the Amoongus as... Oh, they're going after the Dragapult. Um, so expecting a switch out there, I'd imagine. Not the huge amount of damage you'd want from that turn. And leaving the Amoongus alone means it's completely free to spore this Cinderace. And these Gigantamax turns are about to get a whole lot harder for Jonathan. Ooh, I mean, Jonathan maybe thinking the Amoongus was going to switch out. I mean, with the team sheets, you would be privy to the item that would be on that Amoongus. So if you thought it was going to stay in, you would potentially want to double up into that slot, knowing that the max airstream wouldn't be enough. But really brave play there by Yosef, keeping it on the field, despite being against two, two fire-type Pokemon with the ability, the access, I should say, to the max airstream. And Dragapult looking so strong going into this next turn. When I saw the Flublets from the... Incineroar, I just kind of assumed that it was going to be heading towards that Amoongus, but maybe not falling for that trap. The Amoongus now gets to leave the field and get some Regenerator health back as well, so that could become a problem again later in the game. Another Redirector heading onto the field in the form of the Togekiss. Should be a pretty good turn for it to come in. That Cinderace is guaranteed to have to be asleep in this instance, and uh, I don't think that the Incineroar is the biggest threat to it. So the Incineroar in a really kind of tough position right now. Uh, can't even land proper parting shots where it needs to go. And that Dragon Dance from turn one is paying off because the, the max airstream that we got out of the Cinderace is, is easily matched by that Dragon Dance. Look at that max Phantasm just dealing huge amounts of damage. It does so much into that Cinderace, and Cinderace is powerless to do anything in retaliations. It will have to take, of course, that one turn of sleep thanks to the Spore of Amoongus in the previous turn. Incineroar, however, going for the Burning Jealousy. Um, again, not going to be picking up any burns as Dragapult did not use a move to boost up its own um, stats. If it had gone for something like the Max Airstream, that could have been critical for Incineroar. Yeah, another really smart play there from uh the the player facing down burning jealousy i know we talked about it in a previous round but when you know that's there when you've got the team sheet probably up and, and in front of you let's be honest uh, then you're mm -hmm. able to to think about that and, and just be really wise on, on how you deal with it so really good play there uh, i think from joseph to go for the max phantasm uh, even though there are other kind of tempting options for him there and, and really uh, get exactly what he needed out he's going to keep going with that and completely end the, the Dynamax turns from, from Jonathan's side of the field. Yeah, going into that Cinderace, removing the uh, Gigantamax Pokemon straight away before Jonathan is really able to do too much with it. You know, I only got one turn of the Dynamax off here. Um, and as well, with the Max Phantasm, that Incineroar is going to be sitting at minus two defense. It's going to be a prime target for the next move from that Dragapult. 
Dazzling Gleam comes out though, single target with a critical hit will deal a big chunk of damage and will force Incineroar to access its item and do a little bit of HP recovery, but while Incineroar is still on the field, it's going to be really vulnerable going into the next turn, so quite wisely from Jonathan here, going for that passing shot, might as well reduce the special attack of that Togekiss and hope that no critical hits come out in the future and preserve that Incineroar for later. Joseph is getting so much more value out of his Dynamax turns though, you only get three a game and you got to really make them work for you. He does have to be careful now with uh, how he's playing around those drops, the Milotic heading on in there going to cause some problems with that competitive ability, but now Joseph gets to, to think about it a little, little carefully. Um, he's really forced to think about it carefully now, as you mentioned, burning Jealousy could be an issue if he's uh, boosting his stats, but if he's dropping stats, he's activating competitive. Of course, the clear body means the Intimidate isn't a problem here. Uh, but he just has to be, I think, wise about how he tries to, to see this one out. Yeah, and having got rid of the Cinderace, you know, the Dragapult is going to be the fastest thing here on the field. The Max Airstream boost will have come off from the Incinera as well, thanks to it switching out and back in. So Dragapult looking to be really strong, both offensively and speedily wise. Um, Incinera is going to withdraw from the field, though, just as quickly as it joined. And Rillaboom is going to be the Pokemon of choice here for Jonathan. Going to set around that grassy terrain and... This is an interesting switch in here because the Togekiss with access to something like the Air Slash can still apply a lot of pressure um, as the grass covers the field and activates the grassy oh. seed on that Milotic. Very smart. Switching in the Rillaboom to get the, the seed activation is key. Ooh. And that defense boost probably essential in making sure this Max Phantasm doesn't pick up a knockout. Of course, the defenses will drop and that's going to be a real issue uh, if the Milotic can land huge attacks through competitive there. Uh, so Dragapult definitely looking a little more vulnerable. Togekiss following up immediately though, and it's not enough to get the knockout on Milotic, even with the critical hit. Yeah, it does manage to get the critical hit as Milotic goes for the recover of Mox Max Phantasm, lowering the defense stat, not the special defense, which would have been optimal for that Togekiss if it was able to follow up with some good synergy. But Dragapult able to survive out all of its Dynamax turns and... I think the critical thing with that Dragapult as well is due to the Dragon Dance, it managed to get that plus one attack and clear body means that the Intimidates from the Incineroar aren't going to be reducing that back down to neutral. So Dragapult being incredibly threatening here on the field and the one thing if you're Jonathan you've got to be able to do is find a way to take it down before it inflicts even more damage. There are, as you've said, a defense drop now um, on that Milotic. I mean, it's back down to neutral, um, but it can still apply a lot of pressure going forward. It just has to make sure it can land attacks now this competitive has, has gone up and, and activated here. So Joseph is going to be moving first with this Dragapult. It's in a, a really good position. Of course, Grassy Glide could come through, but this is really a bad position for Grassy Glide. And it's not going to be super effective on either of the Pokemon. So Rillaboom's biggest attack and the most common attack, the reason it's seeing play right now, just isn't of great value. It's, it's kind of forced into these fake out turns, which, yeah, are helpful, but they're not the huge damage you were probably looking for as the Rillaboom player. Well, Fake Out able to shut down the Togekiss from following up with any damage as the Dragon Darts go into both Rillaboom and Milotic. Uh, Milotic not able to be KO'd by that and will be able to get off a Nuller Recover here. Um, that really was a turn if you were, Joseph, you wanted to be able to fire off a Dazzling Gleam or an Air Slash into that Milotic and able to try and pick up a KO. But I think the interesting thing is this Dragapult is hanging on. Milotic keeps being forced to go in for those recovers, um, meaning that it's not dealing out any damage to try and KO this Dragapult. Those recovers, meaning that there's just no damage coming out after a competitive boost. And that's something a lot of people really try and do, is as soon as they get the boost, fire back with an Ice Beam, fire back with a Scold, and, and pick up the knockouts. So the Milotic, mm. uh, just so scared of getting knocked out. Jonathan, seeing it as a core part of his endgame, probably with that Incineroar, uh, is just having to recover every single turn. The Dragon Darts are going to be adding up on the partner Pokemon as well. Like you said earlier, there's no way to conveniently drop Dragapult's attack after that turn one Dragon Dance as well. So Dragon Dance into Dragon Darts is going to keep applying good pressure down on Jonathan's side of the field. You can see here dealing good damage to both of Jonathan's Pokemon, but those recovers. Mina Milotic is regaining HP at the end of all of these turns. Togekiss, however, is able to move on this particular occasion, gets the critical hit onto the Incineroar, but not on the Milotic. So Milotic able to finally fire off an offensive attack and goes for that Muddy Water doing damage to both Pokemon, but not able to pick up any KOs. It doesn't get any Axe Shoe drops either, so once again, Dragapult looking to be so strong. Doesn't have to worry about Fake Out from the Incineroar as its Ghost type, and it just looks to be in such a formidable position. This Dragapult could really sweep the game, and obviously, Muddy Water, not the premium attacking move. Joseph having the information there about what the Milotic has in store to, to fire back with, and Jonathan uh, just 
forfeiting that game, realizing, hey, if I don't get the accuracy drops and you're going to keep hitting me every single turn, I'm not going to be able to get mm -hmm. through these dragon darts. So that Dragapult was, was really key, and it's a really cool offensive Pokemon, obviously new to us in, in Sword and Shield, and I love that it's already uh, making a consistent kind of appearance mm -hmm. in all these formats. The clear body, the fact it can't get faked out, it was, it was really key there for, for Joseph. That was the thing, turn one, Joseph goes for that Dragon dan Dance and is able to just apply so much pressure. And you saw then at the end of the game, when the forfeit got locked in, that Dragapult was still on the field and Jonathan just wasn't able to remove it from play. I think as well the Milotic was just a little bit unfortunate having to keep going for those recovers. If maybe it had access to something like Ice Beam and Jonathan had maybe been able to play a little bit more offensively with it, we would have been able to pick up a KO against the Dragapult. And even if Togekiss had gone for some kind of redirection, it doesn't want to take an Ice Beam either. But unfortunately, due to the drops, it was still forced to click recover. And maybe when we go into game two, we'll be able to see a little bit more offensive play there from Jonathan. I think he needs to find a little more offensive output. And, and he does have to be careful of that Spore. I mean, the Spore is something we can't mm -hmm. overlook. The fact that Amoongus was audacious enough to click Spore <laughs> in front of two fire types and land it on the Dynamax Pokemon as well is a really huge play. And I really can't see Jonathan letting him get away with that in the following turn. Mm -hmm. uh, the fact he threw Flare Blitz towards the Dragapult, maybe expecting something like the Excadrill to switch in, uh, you know, something that he could deal big damage to. It just wasn't to be, and, and that Spore... The Cinderace landed good damage. I mean, that's really cool. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really helpful, but the Cobra Berry was key, and Jonathan now has a lot of information about how Joseph leads and plays the team, so I think that's going to help him in game number two. Well, let's get started into game number two and see if that Amoongus is going to make an appearance and whether it will be as bold and brave as it was in that game one. Jonathan leading out with a slight change. We've got Tyranitar on the field, going to be able to bring the sand to play with the Cinderace. And look, there is the Amoongus once again, Adam, paired up with the Dragapult. So Yosef going for exactly the same strategy as he did in game one. Um, but Jonathan switching things up. Jonathan making changes I think were needed, right? The Incineroar isn't great because it can't intimidate Dragapults. It's so key to remember that the clear body ability really allows one of these huge offensive threats to stay offensive without the use of parting shot or, or something like that. That said, it looks like Joseph may be kind of hovering and mulling over a similar move than the one he made in, in game number one. And If he does that and Jonathan catches him out, uh, this could be a problem. So a lot of kind of smart play. We'll see. Uh, there is already a change. Uh, we'll see if Jonathan can get himself in a better position after that first turn. Yeah, he was really thinking about going for that Dragon Dance once again, but instead decides to preserve the Dragapult for later on, maybe fearing some Dark-type moves coming out from that Tyranitar. And I think it's key being able to bring your own Incineroar into play here to fire off and intimidate. We've seen how beneficial that can be time and time again, and applying it to two physical attackers could be key going forward to negate the damage, especially as Jonathan has logged into the Gigantamax of that Cinderace once again. The interesting thing, though, is the Amoongus is still on the field, and we know a Max Airstream won't pick up a KO, so it's whether Jonathan's able to fire up a double up that will be enough to pick up a KO against that Amoongus, or if Amoongus is going to be able to spore later on. It is going to be the Max Airstream once again coming out from the Cinderace, going to target down into that Amoongus. Cobra Berry's activated. We know it's able to hang on. You can see it survives on 97 HP. Adam, I'm not sure Tyranitar could follow up to pick up a KO. It's got a lot of work to do to, to try and get there and land that damage. Uh, the Cobra Berry, absolutely key once again. Uh, Tyranitar's Rock Slide, definitely not going to try and get there, but a flinch could be really big here, so we'll see if it can do that. It's good damage down on both of them as well, and the Moongus lands its Spore once again, so uh, kind of a bit of a run back of game number one. Uh, Joseph in an interesting position, though, with a lot of damage put down. Yeah, Amoongus able to pull through and get that Spore off is critical for... Joseph here, he can now switch out the Amoongus, um, maybe try and bring that Dragapult back in, start applying some more damage, and you've got the Incineroar there to apply Fake Out to allow you to safely do that. You know that the Cinderace is going to have to take that one turn of sleep. The Cinderace not being able to move this turn, absolutely huge, but I don't think Joseph's in a position to capitalize on it as well as he was in, in game number one, right? It, it, at least in game number one, mm. he'd got the Dragon Dance set up. He was able to kind of press on from there by Dynamaxing and dealing huge damage with those Max Phantasms. So without that available to him, I'm curious if this game's going to go as well for him. I like this play, uh, just kind of slowing the game down and hoping that the, the Cinderace stays asleep next turn as well. Uh, just following up with, with good old Fake Out and Spore. Yeah, I like this play here by Yosef. Able to stop the Tyrant off from going for any more Rock Slides. That would have still dealt some really big damage to that Incineroar. Um, and as well, it does enable that Amoongus to freely go for that Spore. 
Um, you know, again, another rock slide would have been able to pick up the KO. Yosef, though, still in a position, like you said, where he can't take too much advantage of these sleep turns. He needs to now be able to switch up his ball position to get a more offensive presence on the field. Get out of there, Amungus. You're going you're gonna to get caught by the sandstorm <laughs> if you stay in. Amungus, save yourself and, and regenerate her up some health. It looks like that's what he's going for. We do, of course, uh, get to see that information by the, the fact we're looking at it from Joseph's side. So Amungus leaving the field is cool here. Uh, it's helpful for him, but it's still just not a lot of pressure that he can deal with. That's oh. a really huge wake up. Oh, amazing play here by Jonathan, going for the Max Steel Spike on the switch in, knowing that Amungus was probably going to switch out, goes for the super effective move into the Togekiss and able to pick up a clean one hit KO. Really well played here by Jonathan, you know, the Max Steel Spike would have picked up the KO against that Amungus anyway, as it was only on 5 HP, but he actually manages to pick up a solid KO for his troubles, so a really clutch wake up there by the Cinderace, and you know, the Amungus getting on out of there is going to have the Regenerator, but that Cinderace is now awake. It's the Amungus isn't going to be able to survive a null at max airstream. Not at all, and that's Cinderace. I mean, it's not going to be max airstream. That's the last turn of oh, the, the Dynamax there. Uh, but if it can land a flying type attack, it, it'll be uh, easy enough. Or even a fire type should be able to do it as well. Uh, the key thing as well with that max steel spike that I think a lot of people may underrate is it's a defense boost that's going to help out against the Dragapult. The Dragapult was the huge issue, right? The Dragapult was the one dealing mm -hmm. all the damage. And it doesn't have its Dragon Dance set up, so its Dragon Darts aren't as impactful in this, this game. And Jonathan's just really in the driving seat now. I mean, Joseph's two remaining Pokemon outside of the Dragapult are both at, at low health. Uh, they're kind of, you know, in a, a pretty easy position to pick up, um, especially when you see the Tyranitar throwing out Rock Slide. So if Tyranitar wakes up, yeah, things get really bad really quickly. Uh, a lot riding on this Dragapult to, to start picking up knockouts. But these, these are still the first two Pokemon from Jonathan. They're still at pretty much full health. And the Dragapult, as we saw, you know, needs a little bit of help to, to try and get through them. We've seen Dragapults try and sweep before. We've seen them try and come all the way through from, you know, maybe being 4-2 down. They have to lock into Dragon Darts to make sure they're spreading damage. And that means you can't Dynamax and, and get the huge amount of damage that you want to. Yeah, and even though Cinderace isn't able to deal out big damage thanks to the drops, it does try and go for the flinch into that Dragapult, but to no avail, Dragapult able to go for the Dragon Dance, boost up the attack and speed, and once again, it looks to be in a really good position, uh, potentially the optimal opportunity um, for a Dynamax here from Yosef, but the one thing you have to concern yourself with is that Tyranitar, it's still on the field, it's really healthy, and the sleep turns are ticking away, and there's not a lot that Dragapult and Incineroar can do outside of Dynamax, to deal big damage to Tyranitar, so Joseph needs to be able to make the most of these turns and do something quickly to pick up some KOs. Well, fortunately for Joseph, the Tyranitar has taken a bunch of drops to its attack, so it's probably not the most intimidating thing on the field, but it can still just become a real annoyance if you leave it alone. Even if mm. it lands something like a critical hit, uh, it's going to be able to kind of swing momentum back in its favor very, very quickly. I do like that the Dragapult has been able to uh, get a Dragon Dance up, that's really key. And now he has to be so careful of maybe Dynamaxing and throwing out a, a drop there. Um, you know, another switch from Joseph means he's going back into a moon. So that might help out against the Milotic quite significantly. But still so much riding on this Dragapult that does immediately Dynamax mm. now. It's got the dance up. Yeah, lots of ball position changes here with some switching, but one thing that Joseph has to worry about is his Incineroar is now in the back, and Jonathan's Milotic is on the field, and you don't want to accidentally set off that competitive ability once again by bringing in an Intimidate Incineroar. Dragapult, however, with the Dragon Dance up, is now going to be again in a strong position. Goes for that max Worm Wind, so going straight into that Tyranitar is going to lower the attack, but of course will still activate the competitive onto that Milotic. It doesn't even worry about taking the attack drop. Milotic says I can do that all day. I'm a special attacker, so boost that stat up for me, and I'm going to be in a really great position for my trainer here to deal out some big damage. And if Jonathan is able to start dealing out big damage with that Milotic going forward, Dragapult's not going to be in such a strong position. Tyranitar wakes up as well, so that's great that he can start dealing out some double damage with something like the Rock Slides. The Max Worm win there is, is a smart play, trying to drop the attacks of both Cinderace and Tyranitar. Obviously Tyranitar is already exceptionally low, but the, the Cinderace as well would have been uh, a nice addition. The, the fantastic Milotic switch in by Jonathan there, capitalizing on that, and more importantly, differently to game one, the Milotic didn't take the damage, so he doesn't need to start recovering right away. He can spend some mm -hmm. time maybe uh, trying to weave in attacks 
while he's got that advantage. And this Amoongus' Rage Powder could be completely null and void if both Pokemon on Jonathan's side of the field are using the spread attacks that they're kind of known for, right? Exactly. We've seen Muddy Water come out from that Milotic, but Milotic oh my almost word. being hit with a one-hit KO from that Dragapult is able to hang on and will get a second competitive boost. So Milotic looking to be so strong here and still has yet to move in this turn. Dragapult taking a little bit of recoil. Tyrannosaur going for that Rock Slide. Dragapult and Amoongus both able to avoid those. So it really does come down to this Milotic that actually goes for that single target Ice Beam. Going into the Amoongus will easily be able to pick up the KO. And I think Dragapult got a lucky escape there. Dragapult got very lucky that it didn't get knocked out there. Um, but giving over two boosts... In, in a couple of turns to this Milotic is absolutely <laughs> huge. And uh, that said, the Milotic has taken a lot of damage. Uh, by a lot, I mean it, it's very close to getting knocked out. And the Milotic here really probably wishes it had Icy Wind, right? Like, yeah, you wouldn't get the speed drop on Dragapult, but you were at plus four special attack. You'd be able to do crazy amounts of damage. Uh, maybe even a Muddy Water would have been more premium there, but I still think Jonathan's in a great position in this game. The Rock Slide miss, yes, frustrating. Um, but this Milotic is just doing so well. I mean, I'm sure Joseph feels confident he can knock it out. Uh, but there's still a Cinderace in the back, and there's still one more Pokemon we haven't seen. Uh, curious to note from Jonathan's side of the field, he didn't try the little switch where he gets the defense boost through the, the grassy seed there. Uh, kind of interesting mm -hmm. to, to see him not go for that. Maybe after he gave up that information in game number one, he doesn't just want to do the same thing in game two because he's worried Joseph will be able to capitalize on it. So smart from him to make that adaptation he does i think get away with it uh with that very low health cling on and that means yeah he's gonna get taken out by this fake out yeah despite all the boost to my low tick it's hp was so dwindled that fake out is going to be able to pick up the ko and tyranitar also going to be leaving the field due to the max phantasm there uh, by the dragapult so joseph able to really utilize his max turns expertly able to pick up some solid ko's and deal out some good damage but jonathan now able to bring in his two remaining Pokemon um, to still apply a lot of pressure to Joseph here on the field. Cinderace, of course, going to rejoin the field, hasn't taken any of those Intimidates or parting shots, and the Incineroar going to rejoin. Of course, the Intimidate only really going to affect the Incineroar on Joseph's side, clear body, going to help out Dragapult, and I think it's going to come down to whether Jonathan is going to be able to take down this Dragapult or not, or if Dragapult, once again, is going to be in a position to sweep through Jonathan's team. If he can land a, a big attack on Dragapult, he should be able to, to deal with it, right? And that said, you know, he's back to this non-Dynamax version. That non-Dynamax version does rely a little bit too heavily on Dragon Darts for some people's tastes. And uh, while it does a lot of damage, it's going to do good damage because of that Dragon Dance earlier on in the game. Uh, just making sure we get the, the difference between the two moves there. I don't know if it's going to be enough for easy knockouts this early on. Uh, so we'll see if exactly if it can get there. Oh, the Cinderace, so revealing Sucker Punch. That's oh. huge. Even though Joseph knew about it, probably by looking at the team sheet. Yeah, the Dragapult can't handle that. That's a monstrous play. That's so good at locking down this Dragapult. Oh my goodness, that was amazing there from Jonathan. He also was able to win the fake out. We don't know whether it was a speed tie or not, but either way... He went for fake out, so did the Incineroar on Joseph's side. Um, but thanks to the fake out for Jonathan's connecting into Joseph's Incineroar, it wasn't able to go for the fake out potentially into that Cinderace and stop the potential Sucker Punch, meaning that Jonathan was just able to bring in these last two Pokemon and pick up a KO against that Dragapult that caused him so many problems. So what an amazing way to end out that game too. And the most exciting thing is, is in winning in, they're going into a game three. Like the tension is high, the pressure is intense. It's going to be an amazing game three from these players. Well, I think this kind of actually, the end game of that rolls back a few turns, right? When the Milotic manages to mm -hmm. land the Ice Beam and knock out that Amoongus, while at the time you think, wow, I wish he'd spread and dealt damage to the Dragapult, importantly what he does there is actually force down the Joseph to his last two Pokemon. And being down mm -hmm. to his last two Pokemon meant his Incineroar was on the field. It meant that at that time, you know, the Incineroar, yes, it used Fake Out to knock out the Milotic, so then, yeah, the Milotic's knocked out, that's an issue, your four stages of increased special attack is great. But the Milotic being removed from the field lets Incineroar come in, has the Fake Out pressure on his own, and Fake Out taking out the Incineroar, dealing with that, and then that Sucker Punch where Joseph is really, he has to do something in that turn with Dragapult, right? He can't not attack, mm -hmm. uh, because then he's just going to get caught short, but the Sucker Punch locking him down, forcing us to a game three, uh, that game so back and forth, I mean, there's also that huge turn early on where... The Cinderace wakes up after one turn of sleep and lands a max steel spike. Not only does he land the steel spike, he lands it into an incoming Togekiss as well. So a really mm -hmm. good game for Jonathan 
on a couple of pivotal turns. I think some smart adaptations not showing uh, some of these changes. Really, really cool. Uh, but, uh, you know, um, maybe the Milotic doesn't need its grassy seed. Maybe maybe he's over <laughs> overthinking it there. I mean, there's been sort of heroes in all of these games. Game one, it was the Dragapult there for Joseph, being able to get that attack boost straight away and apply loads of pressure. But in game two for Jonathan, it was definitely that Cinderace. And you listed all the amazing things it managed to do in that game. And I think preserving it was excellent play there by Jonathan. And I wonder in game three, who's going to be the hero Pokemon. So let's jump right into the action and find out which of these Pokemon trainers are going to be advancing into the finals. It's going to be so intense for both of them. They know exactly what they're fighting for. Jonathan changing things up brings that Cinderace to the fray, but also brings in the Milotic. So straight away trying to catch a potential Intimidate. As Joseph changed things up as well, there's no Amoongus, maybe taking a little bit of a rest in the back of Joseph, and it's going to be the Togekiss and the Excadrill. I like the adaptation. I think both trainers have made smart decisions. Putting the Milotic in the front for Jonathan says, hey, if you bring this Incineroar, I'm going to just go from there and, and start using my competitive boost right off the bat. I also like that Joseph's bought the Excadrill. The Excadrill was something that we hadn't seen yet in this set and actually provides a surprising amount of, of presence, I think, here. Uh, it looks like the Dragapult's been completely left at home, so Dragapult not going to be a part of this last dance in the Players' Cup of brackets to, to get through to the finals. Uh, and Excadrill kind of trying to carry its own weight here and, and show that it doesn't need its partner Tyranitar, and it can actually do so much on its own. Joseph, though, once again, a little unhappy with his lead, immediately making a switch. Yeah, that Amoongus is back in action. You could potentially have thought that there might have been a Tyranitar switch in there to help out the speed of that Exegel, but instead, Amoongus going to join at the fray as Incineroar comes in for Jonathan, knowing that that Milotic isn't going to be sitting there applying any pressure with Ice Beam onto a Dragapult or an Amoongus, and there's no competitive boost, might as well save it in the back for later when it can be more useful, and being able to intimidate that Excadrill could be key going forward. Jonathan, however, going to go straight for that Dynamax once again, turn one, going to be that Cinderace that for once isn't going to be threatened by the Amoongus going for a sport in this first turn. It's going to be free to go for something like a Max Airstream and start boosting up the speed, but I wonder who it targeted. We'll have to see the Steel Spike heading where I imagine the Togekiss was heading. I don't think many people would throw that uh, towards the uh, Excadrill. So yeah, the, the Amoongus takes that okay, I guess. I don't want to say it took it well, but it took it okay. Uh, and, and it's going to be easy to get knocked out by the Cinderace in the next turn. Yeah, honestly, that Max Steel Spike deals so much damage, but Joseph once again using turn one to set up with one of his Pokemon in this turn, the Excadrill, and boosting up that attack stat. So Excadrill looking to be so strong, now going to be at sort of plus one. Once again, a prime Pokemon choice to Dynamax. I'm going to be honest, that is an eye-watering amount of damage on an Amoongus from, uh, <laughs> you know, a not, not a fire or flying type attack, and... Being forced to switch could be so frustrating here. And I think Joseph's a little bit on the back foot, right? He's got this Swords Dance up on his, his Excadrill. So he's been able to counteract what the Incineroar did with its Intimidate. That's pretty smart there. But now he has to be careful of the Fake Out from the Incineroar. So he's forced into protecting. I do like it from a longer term point of view. Where when he does finally decide to Dynamax, he's going to be kind of mismatching the Dynamax from Jonathan. The big thing here is he just needs to get through the next two turns of Jonathan's Dynamax on this Cinderace, and, and that is not always the easiest ask, especially as well if the Cinderace <laughs> is going to keep adding important boosts to Jonathan's side of the field, such as the defense. Yeah, some defensive plays here by Joseph, knowing that that Amoongus needs to regenerate a little bit of health and retreats it back into the Pokeball instead of Incineroar that's going to have to take that Max Airstream. Does manage to take it really well, much better than the Amoongus would have for sure, even with the Cobra Berry. The depleted HP would not have been enough to preserve the Amoongus going forward. Incineroar going for that Parting Shot, but it's going to connect onto the Excadrill here. So Excadrill able to hang on in this turn. Excadrill being able to stay around i think is really important especially if you've committed so much to setting up its swords dance boosts you really need it to do a lot of work there that said it's one more turn of dynamax for the cinderace and if jonathan can get good value out of it he could put himself in a a really good position joe hovering such an interesting and quite honestly audacious choice in this menu <laughs> yeah, Joseph has been making quite a few bold plays, whether it's by clicking those boosting moves or whether it's by keeping Amoongus on the field in front of two fire types. And I think that play style definitely is working out for him 
um, in this situation where he's just able to apply so much pressure to Jonathan, but Jonathan's still looking to be in a strong position, particularly with the Cinderace going for that max knuckle. Um, Libero changing it into the fighting type here, and we'll be able to boost up the attack stats on Jonathan's side of the field while also picking up a KO against that Incineroar. So Jonathan no longer has to worry about Incineroar coming in, firing those Intimidates, and having that fake out utility on Joseph's side. Like I think that's actually a really critical KO for Jonathan. That's really big, being able to take out the Incineroar. Um, but the extra drill getting another sword <laughs> stance here is, um, it's a lot. I mean, it's going to be a lot to handle. And Joseph has really committed to saying Excadrill is going to win me this game. This parting shot, yeah, it's great. You get to lower the attack stat. But he's still at plus two because it's now two sword mm -hmm. stances and intimidate and a parting shot. So there's going to have to be a lot more switching around to bring that Excadrill back to a more manageable state. Um, but it, there, there's so much riding on it now. You've got two Pokemon that can redirect and cause problems. Uh, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. if you can keep all the attention off this Excadrill, then, you know, there may be a way for Joseph to win this game, even though he's lost the first Pokemon. Jonathan's got a really nice trio of boosts in defense, speed, and attack on his Cinderace as his Dynamax ends. That's probably the perfect trio. Kind of frustrating, had to switch out his Incineroar and, and lose some of those boosts. But, you know, this Excadrill, everything riding on it right there. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many adjustments from Joseph here. He doesn't have the Tyranitar to help with the extra drill, and also critically, you know, we've had all four Pokemon revealed. There's no Dragapult here. That extra drill is going to be the prime candidate for Dynamax, Ooh. and that plus two, with the supportive moves that Joseph has, being able to bring some redirection around and keep it a little bit safe from any of those uh, moves coming out from Jonathan's side, it's going to be a really strong Pokemon for him. And I think it's wise by Jonathan to bring in the Milotic. Oh, well, he's, he's bringing it back out now, but I was going to say to apply some of that water type pressure. Brings in the Incineroar once again, however, and again, this makes a lot of sense. You want to try and negate those attack boosts that the Exodrill has got, um, trying to bring them down as close to neutral as you can possibly get, as Joseph does actually go for the Dynamax. Yeah, Dynamax, not where we were expecting either. I think after so many Swords Dance hmm. Protects, we were expecting everything on the Exodrill, and this is really cool. This is one of those mind games where you play so heavily around one Pokemon in that Exodrill. He's been setting up boosts. He's probably going to be drawing a lot of attention to it, just by the fact it's on the field and, and causing problems. Now it's protecting as well, so if Jonathan's decided to target down with this Cinderace, it could be causing problems. Of course, Cinderace more likely going to try and deal with this Togekiss, but the Togekiss is Dynamax, so it can definitely take that hit. Um, there's just a lot going into this Excadrill, and it's not even attacking yet. I like the Togekiss matching the max Airstream boost, and dealing a good amount of damage for its troubles as well. So uh, the critical hit Ooh. making that a whole lot better. And I'm very interested to see what these kind of pairings do. I was expecting Exodor to Dynamax and it just looks like that's not going to be the case. I honestly really like this play here by Yosef. You know, being able to go for those max airstreams means you're going to be able to get the speed up. And if you can outspeed that Cinderace and be able to pick your moves based on knowing what its Libero ability already is, you know, it doesn't have the chance to change. You can go for something like an Earthquake with your Excadrill. Togekiss isn't going to take any damage, but if you catch Cinderace in while it's still a Steel type, you're going to be able to pick up a lot of damage. Um, however, decides to switch out the extra, maybe wants to save it for more of an endgame situation, bringing in the Amoongus. Cinderace, however, still being able to outspeed, of course, goes for that high jump kick. Going to target down into the Amoongus that just switched in, and Amoongus for once is able to really take an attack coming out from this Cinderace really well. So good um, sort of um, defensive plays there by the Amoongus as Max Airstream comes out from that Togekiss. So Joseph really trying to keep the speed up on his side, applying a lot of pressure with that Togekiss, making sure that it's going to be really speedy as the HP is being depleted on Jonathan's side. You know, if this Togekiss is able to hang around, and it's against low HP Pokemon, and it's speedy, it's going to be able to pick up some KOs with those Dazzling Gleams. And Jonathan going for that parting shot once again, just wants to try and keep the Incineroar in the back to try and apply some fake out pressure going forward and keep that Intimidate around for when Exodor rejoins the field. I think this this play with the Airstream is really good, actually. It's setting up for later in the game when this Togekiss can just throw out attacks before anything gets to move. Of course, the Cinderace, the only thing on the field remaining with the earlier Airstream boost that it set up itself. So really kind of mm. smart play there for, from Joseph, trying to find a, a perfect end game for himself. It's going to be taxing. Uh, it's going to be very difficult and, and getting damage down is key here for him. Uh, but Jonathan's played around this very well, uh, mixing up his typing, really good uh, attempt at the Exodrill there with the high jump kick. Obviously, the Amoongus came in and caused some problems in that regard. Uh, but Amoongus now 
could try and just buy one more turn for Togekiss to really capitalize on its, its exact position on the board. So we'll see if it's able to do that. Um, and a, a high jump kick could be dangerous if, if he's trying to maybe call a switch into the Excadrill. You know, Amoongus is low. Amoongus is easy to knock mm -hmm. out. If this Amoongus gets a high jump kick thrown at it and it misses, could be disastrous for Jonathan. Well, my low take revealing itself to have helping hand here. So Jonathan really putting all his eggs in the basket here with that Cinderace. Amoongus, however, going to go for that Rage Powder, going to draw in whatever attack Cinderace has gone for, leaving Togekiss free to go for a safe max airstream here. Going to connect into that Milotic. Not going to be activating competitive, so really wise choice here. Just keeping the speed up on Joseph's side uh, while dealing out a really big chunk of damage. The Togekiss looking so strong as its Dynamax turns will end. Uh, Cinderace going for that Iron Head though, so going to connect into the Amoongus with the Helping Hand. I think it's going to be able to pick up that KO, Adam. Yeah, no, no issue there in, in picking up that Helping Hand, but most importantly, the Cinderace actually faints on that turn, the Life Orb recoil, enough to take it out. So uh, a really interesting position now with this Togekiss ending its Dynamax turns with three speed boosts from Max Airstream. It's hands down going to be the quickest thing on the field. And, crucially, even though it's taken some parting shots, it's able to start using spread moves again. And it, when it's using spread moves, it doesn't matter if you're, you're doing huge damage. Um, you are going to be in a position to try and fish for those critical hits, which, of course, Togekiss is really, really good at. Um, that said, there really could be an endgame here for Joseph where he just uses spread moves every single turn. Earthquake and something like Dazzling Gleam is just going to be putting down so much damage. The extra drill helps out here, I think. Uh, providing fake out, parting shot, and intimidate pressure all in one. But, you know, there's there's certain concerns about uh, how he's going to kind of get through this turn. So the extra drill is something to be watched out for. Uh, Joseph taking his time in the menu. Oh boy, uh, that's that's oh. a choice that he's mulling over. We'll see if he goes for it. Uh, this game definitely running a whole lot longer than, than some of our previous ones. Uh, I think the other games were a little more one-sided for each, each player. Uh, but... Joseph's going all the way for his move time on this one. Yeah, Joseph really taking every second to double check exactly what strategy he wants to go for. Does He, he wants to make sure he gets that perfect synergy, but also be able to stop Jonathan from putting himself in a position to have that board advantage. Going for the air Ooh. slash actually into that Milotic. Um, going to be able to pick up... Oh, no, it's, I don't think it is. I think it's still hanging on. Yes, Milotic able to hang on Oof. once again as the Excadrill goes for that Earthquake. Milotic, so brave being able to hang on, but to no avail as the Earthquake picks up a double KO. And I love that synergy that Joseph has got in, you know, wisely protecting, or I should say preserving that Excadrill previously. You know, it had plus two attack. Why would you want to switch out? This is exactly why. So you can have this end game situation where you can go for Earthquake, you don't hurt your partner Pokemon, and you can still pick up some solid KOs. That turns absolutely monstrous, purely because there's no fake out from Jonathan. Maybe assuming a double protect and trying to weave something else in. Uh, you know, he will know about both Pokemon on Joseph's side of the field having protect. And uh, this is not a premium Pokemon to be put in front of Excadrill and Togekiss. Uh, certainly going to be an interesting one. Uh, Joseph, if he's able to, to wrap this up nice and tidy, should, should be able to, to deal with a lot of threats here. Uh, anything that this... this Tyranitar has access to should be able to, to deal with it. Uh, Togekiss making sure this extra drill is also given its time to shine, I imagine. I mean, the sand as well, activating that sand rush ability of extra drill, meaning it's going to be super speedy in this sandstorm and goes for that um, sword stance. So it's also going to be super offensive. Um, you know, there's not a lot that the Tyranitar can really do to an extra drill in this situation. So wise to go for that sword stance meaning that you can apply so much pressure to that tower on the and try and pick up a solid one hit ko against it in the next turn as long as it isn't something like a focus sash on there um but either way such good damage there um by Joseph going for that Earthquake, connecting onto the tyranitar and it is able to pick up a solid one hit ko and joseph will be advancing into finals what a set that was a fantastic set played by both players so back and forth. Mm -hmm. I mean, game one, two, and three, it was to me, to you, to me, to you, and the, the way the momentum was shifting and picking up wins, obviously. But game three has so much going on from the value that both Dynamaxes were providing, the, the Cinderace providing huge value for Jonathan, and then coming back with the Togekiss, even after the whole game had drawn so much attention and focus on the Excadrill to turn around, use your Togekiss, land three max airstreams, deal huge damage, mm -hmm. really, really key. And, and that 